Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can see my slides. My name is James Neal. I am a senior library program officer with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, more commonly known as the IMLS. This afternoon, you have joined us for a presentation on the subject of federal funding for OER, a spotlight on IMLS grants. My email is at the bottom with my Twitter handle as well. We'd love to hear from you and get your feedback after the presentation. We will be hearing from four recent grantees of IMLS grants, all in the realm of OER. I will allow each participant to introduce themselves during the time of their presentation. For now, let me tell you a little bit about IMLS. What is IMLS? The Institute of Museum and Library Services is a part of the federal government. We are a United States federal government agency. We're what is known as a petite agency meaning that we have a relatively small budget and we have a relatively small staff, but we are impactful and we are potent and we have a very strong interest in OER. I live in the Washington DC area. Our offices are located in Washington DC. We were established in 1996 and IMLS is the primary source of federal support and funding for the nation's libraries, archives, and museums. So what does IMLS do? IMLS has a number of grant programs that impact libraries, archives, and museums across the United States, its freely associated states, and territories, which includes places like Guam and Puerto Rico. We also, by promulgating grants, and making grants are in the business of forming and shaping policymaking throughout the United States. And from time to time, we will host convenings on special subject matters. We have a number of national initiatives and partnerships with our sister agencies across the federal government. We also have an office of research and evaluation that is able to provide data, especially regarding public libraries across the United States. We are visionary and we are mission driven. Our vision involves a world that includes museums and libraries working in collaboration to impact and transform the lives of individuals and communities. Our mission is driven by empowerment related to grant making, research and policy development. We are impactful. For fiscal year 2020, we were able to give out and award grants through our normal grant making processes. And the tune was about $280.6 million across all of our grant programs. Our largest library grant program includes what is known as our grants to states program. Each state across the United States has a state library administrative agency or a state library. We are able to give each of those state libraries federal funds that they can use as they see fit or in accordance with IMLS directives. The program that I work with and what we'll be talking about today are the discretionary programs. These are competitive awards that are made to libraries and archives across the United States. The National Leadership Grant Program for libraries is interested in proposals and projects that generate results such as new models, new tools, research findings, services, practices, and or alliances that can be used adapted, scaled, or replicated to extend and leverage the benefit of federal investment. We hope to address 
critical needs of libraries and archives through our National Leadership Grants Program. Second, we have our Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program, which we commonly refer to as LB21. This program specifically addresses professional development and training for libraries and librarians with, a, with an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. IMLS over the past several years, uh, about five years now, has been focused on OER as a strategy. We all recognize that the foundation of OER is textbook affordability. The pandemic has shown us in quick relief and clear relief that there's also an urgent need to address student precarity. There are students who face food insecurity, housing insecurity, in addition to the high cost of education, as well as textbooks. However, it should be stated and emphasized that IMLS's interest in open educational resources is part of a larger vision and mission that includes the environment of open education in general, open data, open science, open access. So this afternoon, we hope to be able to address some of these issues by featuring four of our grantees who have done stellar work in the area of open education, focused on open educational resources. We'll begin with David Ernst, who is from the University of Minnesota and a part of what is known as the Open Education Network. David, the digital podium is yours. Thank you so much, James. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is David Ernst. I am the director of the Center for Open Education at the University of Minnesota and the executive director of the Open Education Network. And if you're not familiar with what the Open Education Network is, I'll briefly, briefly describe it here in just a minute. Next slide, please, James. First, I wanted to start by kind of giving credit where credit is due. The program I'm about to describe would not exist if not for the generous funding of the IMLS. It's, it's, it's clear just the fact that uh, it, it, IMLS is taking part in this conference and all of these projects that you're gonna hear about are, are uh, funded through them, their, their commitment to openness, which um, again, is, um, has been really important to the work that we do. And I wanna describe one of the projects we've been involved with with them. Next slide. The Open Education Network um, is a uh, community of um, over 350 members representing, um, there we go, 318 members. Sorry, I'm losing track already. Uh, this, that number is actually from last week, so it might be 350 by now. Uh, representing over 1,600 institutions nationally, colleges and universities. Um, it includes institutions, individual institution members, and also state library consortia and other consortia and statewide systems. Um, so it's a very large community. The University of Minnesota, the Open Education Network is, is simply the community of these, or of these institutions. The University of Minnesota is one of those institutions. We just happen to be kind of hosting this community, but we're really just a group of institutions trying to do this work, sharing knowledge, and, and move things forward together. Next slide, please. So the project that I'm about to describe um, came from kind of this justification. This came from the grant proposal we submitted to IMLS. So academic librarians are ideal professionals on campuses direct to direct open textbook programs, but there is no professional development program to prepare librarians to do so. This was written in 2017 when I wrote this proposal um, and so uh, the project that we are um, talking about today is actually the development of a certificate program for OER librarians. Next slide, please. This project involved um, engaging uh, experts from across our community uh, to come together and write curriculum. Um, this is a list of them. Will is with us today. Um, and, uh, and for others. Um, 
alongside the OEN staff, Karen, Sarah, and myself. Um, these are really the brains behind the program curriculum development. That was a lot of work, took a lot of time, uh, took a, a, a few days in Minnesota, locking ourselves in a room to get it done. And um, uh, it really ended up with a, with a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, structured curriculum. Next slide, please. So the program structure, um, the first year of this program, um, this first year of the program was involved in in-person in in -person meetings. So I'm gonna give you this structure, but keep in mind the structure changed because of COVID as did most professional development programs. Um, it started with an online kind of informational, kind of get everyone on the same page um, grounding and a little bit of community building and then a meeting in person. And that first year that we met in person, I think was 2018. And uh, it was a pre-conference to the um, ACRL conference in Cleveland, Ohio. And so um, the, the, we had a meeting of, I think it was about 31 librarians coming together in their cohorts, meeting their, meeting their um, mentors who are assigned to each cohort. Um, and the mentors are the, the, the people we saw on the previous slide, the curriculum developers continued on as mentors and instructors. So there's an online component, an in-person component, and then a period of mentoring, which we'll look at here in a minute. And then and, uh, as everything that we do in the OEN, it's always very action grounded. And we really um, wanna ground things in getting things done. So it isn't just professional development program. The intent of the program also is also to move things forward on the campuses of those librarians who are involved and to help them move things forward. Um, so the culmination of all of the work here that you see is an action plan that they um, give to their supervisors and their supervisors support them moving forward with. Next slide, please. This is a really high level given the time we have. This is about all I, I uh, the time I have. This, the, this is the detail I can give you about what is covered. Um, this curriculum changes every year, I'll tell you that, but the overall um, topics are, are right here. So just been basically a grounding in open education, um, OER and the Creative Commons licenses, um, making the case, in other words, how do you have conversations about open education on your campuses? Um, we find that's just a really important part of building programs, open education programs, it's just how to communicate it, how to communicate it to leaders, how to communicate it to faculty, students, and so on. Module number three is the role of librarians in that. Um, it takes a community, but uh, librarians have one very central role in leading these open education programs. So we talk about the role of librarians in that. Module four, our best practices for building a program. So this is based on um, experience from the, the network and from our community about what works and what doesn't work as far as programs go um, and supporting them. And then the making it real is how to take this back, as we said, and, and make action out of it. Next slide, please, James. Thank you. So this is how it's progressed. Oh, I'm sorry, some of this got pushed off the slide here, but um, our first year, oh, actually it was 2019. There we go, I was off by a year. Uh, we developed a curriculum in 2018. The first year had 31 participants. We had five weeks of online work. We were in Cleveland at the ACRL conference for three days. And then there's five months of mentorship as the students actually develop the action plans and, and start work on it. Um, that first year, there was, there was very little cost to the participants because the, this was uh, funded by the IMLS this first year. The curriculum development was funded along with um, the majority of expenses from the pilot year. The second year, we decided to, that we could handle expanding it. So we increased the number of cohorts um, so that there ended up being 56 students. Um, of course, that's 2020. And we had to shift suddenly and um, everything ended up being online. And um, we also added in that year, um, we built into our kind of budget model. Um, we wanted to make sure that we made this uh, program as um, accessible as possible. It takes funds to run it on an ongoing basis. 
Um, but we wanted to make it as accessible, accessible as possible. So our budget model made sure that we made room for resource poor institutions. So any, any librarian who says, I wanna be part of this, but my institution can't afford it. Um, um, we, we got 17 requests and we were able to grant all 17 of those that year. So uh, we're really happy about that. In 2021, we increased it one more cohort to 64, which I think is where we're gonna keep it here for a while. The same, uh, the same format, an online for 10 weeks, mentorship for five months. Um, again, we had nine requests from resource poor institutions. We were able to honor all of those. And then we've also implemented in an attempt to bring more BIPOC librarians into open education. And um, we offered full scholarships for um, BIPOC librarians and were able to grant seven of those um, last year. This year, we just opened um, the uh, applications for the, this fourth iteration of the certificate. We will have, we will be enrolling 64. Uh, we hate to turn people away, but we, uh, that's where we're, that's where we're at. That's what we can handle. And we will again be honoring the resource for institutions and, uh, and uh, opportunities to involve BIPOC librarians. Next please. The curriculum and uh, this work is now in the hands, the very capable hands of our Director of Educational Programs, Tanya Gross. Next slide, please, James. It's in constant uh, development uh, and we have brought on uh, new uh, instructors here. You can see these are our list of eight instructors. We have 64 students and cohorts of eight. So these are both instructors and they serve as mentors in the, in the, the long term as the students are creating their, their action plan. Um, and, um, and again, it continues to evolve every year. Tanya brings this group back together and says, um, can I, what, what, what needs improving? Um, not only is the curriculum improving because we're seeing holes or we're seeing neat opportunities, but the whole field has changed over the last few years, obviously, and it's trying, it's moving in the direct, changing um, based on that as well. Next slide, please, James. And those, and those changes are, are, are listed here. I don't have to um, reiterate it, but, but basically expanding behind the beyond affordability into more broader equity issues. We're doing that in all of our programs in the OEM. Um, and of course, as everyone, we're trying to find more ways to connect participants in the virtual environment. Um, one thing we hear from them, uh, our participants, um, the number one uh, feedback we get is we love the connectedness and being be able to connect with our cohorts. Can we find more ways to do that? So um, if anyone has any ideas, we would love to we would love to hear that. So that's the uh, next slide, please. That's the certificate and open an uh, OER librarianship. There's a URL there if you're interested in applying for this year's cohort or interested in more information. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate the information that you have shared. Next, we will have Lisa Petridis of ISCME. Hi, uh, good, good day, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Lisa Petridis, and I am the CEO at ISCME, which is the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. We're a nonprofit uh, that works across K-12, higher ed, uh, in the U.S. and also internationally to make learning and knowledge sharing participatory, equitable, and open. And we also run um, the digital public library OER Commons. And we also host many libraries for state departments of ed and ministries of education and other organizations uh, as well. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you just a little bit of the timeline of our work with IMLS um, to show how uh, when you work sort of deeply with a funder over time, it's really an opportunity to build on the work that you do. And, and, and also for those of you who some of you are probably here because you're thinking about how do I get IMLS funding? And you know, th the question is that, that I always say to people is that anything having to do with funding are conversations and building relationships over time. So our first one of our first conversations uh, was with uh, an IMLS program officer, you know, uh, a good, a good uh, four or five years before we ever applied for uh, a grant ourselves. 
Um, in 2013, we became the stewards of the National Science Digital Libraries, which had um, an NSF and I believe IMLS funding and that got us to really understand and to, um, and, and it was just so gratifying to see IMLS also formally acknowledge that uh, libraries and librarians were really key OER stakeholders. Uh, because early on in the field of OER, there was much more about how do we get content produced and, and about affordability, all important things. But the role of the librarian was really starting to come into shape. Uh, and we got our first IMLS grant in 2014, which was really about um, just sort of systemically trying to elevate and expand the role of school librarians and saying that they, can, you know, their capacity as instructional leaders uh, shouldn't be ignored when you're creating OER. And that first grant, we were able to put together librarians and STEM teachers to create curriculum and really begin to understand uh, how that kind of relationship could develop. The next grant was in 2017. And it, by that point now, <clears throat> it was really about documenting the OER digital curation practices of librarians. Uh, and this was school librarians. So it was a very exciting time. We even ended up creating an OER curation guidebook for librarians. Uh, there was just a, an explosion and a growth of librarians in the field of OER. Uh, and then, um, then the next year, or a couple of years later, we tried again for um, a, a grant and we were rejected. So I like to put that out there because you know not everything ends in, in success. And, but what we were trying to do now, uh, again, building on the previous work was really kind of a simple premise, which is how do we help librarians leverage the work of their peers in this whole OER curation process? Because there, aren't, there hadn't been really efficient ways to do that, um, to connect both to the libraries that, that we run through OER Commons and our partners, as well as digital libraries um, you know, across, across the world, across the country. Um, next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little bit about our, our current grant, which is a collaboration with six um, academic consortia. And we're studying how faculty and library set how they search and discover OER, and then sort of prototyping and designing a set of automated processes that allows them to share uh, across uh, libraries and institutions and repositories. So it's really about breaking down the institutional silos and, and creating community driven ways for OER practitioners to share their work and support the growth of the field. Uh, over the long term, uh, really this um, kind of exchange uh, is going to produce a reduction in these kind of curation silos, uh, reducing the time spent by library staff and faculty and identifying and adapting relevant OER, and of course, ultimately decreasing the financial burden on students and increasing their student engagement and success. And there's lots of research, and I'm sure many of you here uh, today are familiar with the research that shows that this is moving absolutely in, in that direction. Um, so uh, we will hear more about this. This is a three year grant. It's really doing the research and the prototyping and testing for us to be creating uh, what uh, we're right now calling the um, open metadata exchange, but is really a way to exchange resources that have very rich uh, content metadata about alignment of standards and use, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Now, what makes this so different, I think, that what we're doing here just as a field and here at this conference is that, you know, we are growing the field together. It's not like we are, you know, chemists doing research in a field that has been, you know, funded for 40 years and you just, you know, take the new advancements and innovations. We have actually been creating this field together. And I just want to say that I really think that um, IMLS has been a model for how these funder grantee relationships can can promote that and grow the field together. And, and part of that is, and of course, with a, a hat tip uh, to our, our moderator, to James Neal here, who has absolutely, I, I want to say single handedly, but really what he's been quite terrific at is building a community, building understanding within IMLS, and then building a community even of 
grantees that we're all here right now together doing this and, and talking together is sort of a testament for how you grow the field together. So you build a common understanding of your work in your field. And it's been so important to really put together those pieces of funding that chart you know, your path forward. I think it's so it's it's uh, all too common, especially as nonprofits looking for funding for work, that you kind of jump on the train of of a funder who's going in a certain direction that really wasn't that your intention. So I think continually sort of under making sure that your work is actually aligned with your funders' goals and you know that proverbial don't try to fit the square peg in the round hole. And I think that um, IMLS has been a great modeled for sort of saying, wait a minute, how is how does this really fit? Uh, and um, if it doesn't, then this isn't how it, how it should work. So the other, uh, this is two final pieces, you know, one is about taking advantage of the opportunities with your funder, in this case, IMLS, to really build relationships in the field. So for example, there have been opportunities to do cross grantee advising, um, I had the privilege to serve on an advisory board for the next grant that you'll hear about um, with um, uh, South Carolina State University. And those are such rich opportunities to not only offer expertise back, but also to just learn about what others in the field um, are doing uh, that's related or is kind of a cousin to the work you're doing. Again, this is the growing the field together. Um, and lastly, uh, and uh, James didn't ask me to say this, but I just want to say that you should always say yes to requests to review other proposals because you learn from them, you understand about proposal writing better, you see what makes a proposal strong or not, but it's really more than that. It's a very important service work to the field. And we, can, we need to be always learning and growing from uh, these experiences. And that is how we've been, you know, really, I would say, growing this field together uh, for the last several years. And that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Um, just a moment, Dr. Hodges, I want to give a brief introduction to you. Uh, I'm from South Carolina. So in particular, uh, this is a near and dear project to my heart, and I'm also a graduate of Morehouse College and HBCU. We will now have Dr. Ruth Hodges discuss her grant, uh, HBCU uh, and OER. Thank you. Okay, I'm a bit anxious. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Ruth Hodges, Interim Dean of Library and Information Services at South Carolina State University. Uh, next slide, please. My coverage today includes that an overview, insights into the grant process, my HBCU Academic Librarians OER grant experience, and the impact of the HBCU Librarians grant on the OER ecosystem, lessons learned, and the conclusion. Next slide, please. Well, an overview uh, of my experience is to say that I had, we had a wonderful experience as IMLS grantees. I found the agency and Mr. Neal, the program officer to be very supportive of our project. And we too wish to thank IMLS for its funding. Next slide, please. While working on this grant, I gained a number of insights. Some of these um, include, uh, one, I learned that any modification of the grant personnel budget and related grant activities require approval of the program officer. And I'm going through this as a newbie. <laughs> This is also to ensure that the grant experience is in compliance with federal regulations. Therefore, grantees just can't change um, personnel and other things at a whim. Two, I gained more insight about the criteria and review of the selection of grantees while working or serving as an IMLS grant reviewer. 
Three, I gained more insight about the intricacies of the South Carolina State University sponsored programs requirements and support that it provides grant recipients during the post award process. Next slide, please. Since the remainder of this presentation pertains to South Carolina State's grant initiative, I will share some of the details of our project. Um, next slide. Oh. oh, go back, please. Oh, well, okay. The name of our project is the South Carolina State um, is the HBCU Academic Librarians OER project. It's supposed its purpose is to increase knowledge among HBCU academic librarians about the various types of OER, as well as to increase their awareness of the strategic role of the library in promoting and sustaining OER initiatives on their campuses. Additionally, we aim to increase the number of academic courses utilizing no cost or low cost materials, including OER at HBCUs. Our key project activities included a one half day summit or pre-summit on copyright and creative commons, a one and a half day OER summit, three professional development webinars, and our final activity was the textbook transformation grants sub awards. Next slide, please. Okay, through this collaborative, um, through this grant, my co PI, Dr. Diane Burnett, and I were afforded the opportunity to meet and collaborate with several leaders in the OER community. Leaders such as Lisa Petrides of ISME, Nicole Allen of Spark, Jeff Gallant of Affordable Learning, and Will Cross of the Library Copyright yeah. Institute. They all assisted with the implementation of various project activities by either serving as presenters at the pre-summit and summit, formally serving on our advisory, advisory board or informally advising my co-PI and me about the project. For example, um, we were also fortunate to have David Williamson of the OpenStax to conduct a presentation on OpenStax for our first webinar. Additionally, David Ernst, who I met at an OER workshop on our campus, shared some of his insights regarding the cultural aspects of OER. Interestingly, some of our participants indicated in their open-ended survey responses that it was difficult finding culturally appealing OER. So there is a need for more culturally focused OER. As you can see, members of the OER community were very supportive of our project and were generous with their commitment and time. Okay, this particular slide shows the impact of OER uh, on our project on the OER ecosystem and can be seen through the various accomplishments. As you can see here, 48% of the HBCUs represented at the um, summit um, came from among the 104 HBCs in the US. So we were successful in getting them at our summit. Our grant reached 400 37 individuals through its professional development training. Uh, librarian faculty teams from 12 HBCUs were awarded the textbook transformation grants subawards to redesign a general education course or GEC to replace 
a commercial textbook with a low cost or no cost materials, including OER. Next slide, please. Additionally, cost savings for students at HBCUs is one of the biggest impacts of our grant. For example, the textbook transformation grant grants resulted in one semester cost savings of over $120,000 for 1,171 students at 12 HBCUs that redesigned and implemented the OER course materials. Next slide, please. Some lessons learned included education, active participation, other early and frequent types of engagements are key to administrator buy-in, such as that of the provost. Successful librarian and faculty collaboration require a genuine commitment by both parties. And finally, more needs to be done to address racial inequities in technology access and use, which have implications for effective OER utilization at HBCUs in the communities being most served by these institutions. In conclusion, next slide please. It is important to establish a good rapport with the grants program officer and the personnel within your home institution. Um, persons such as the office, offices such as sponsored programs and the grants and contracts office. Also, it is important to understand the granting agency's requirements. These are some factors that can contribute to a wonderful grant experience. Thank you for attending this session. Are there any questions? Oh. We will have questions and answers at the end of the entire presentation. Our next presenter, will be Will Cross uh, from North Carolina State University. Will. Thank you so much. Um, I'm the only thing standing between you all and happy hour. So I'm gonna try to be brief here. Um, I'm the director of the Open Knowledge Center and I, I'm really appreciative of all the amazing presentations we've heard today. One of the themes that I'm gonna ring as well is the sense that we're building these connections and these communities that support one another and lift each other up in different ways. So I wanna specifically call out Maria Bonn and Josh Bullock who are co-PIs on this work who have been amazing partners along with the folks that you see smiling up here today. So next slide, please. So in, in the spirit of the sort of progressive and iterative work that we've heard about today, the initial impetus for this grant, the Scholarly Communication Notebook, comes from a series of conversations that we had at a, at a gathering that IMLS supported to talk about the sort of bi-directional opportunities for open education and LIS education, that, that on the one hand, OER reduces costs for library students just like anybody else, and library students would benefit from the, the remixable materials and the more culturally responsive materials and that sort of thing. By the same token, if we prepare the next generation of librarians to understand why OER are exciting and important and give them that experience on the ground, they will give us a better field in open education as well. So that sort of back and forth connection was the, the first part of the conversation that we had at, you can see this symposium where we gathered, you can see, gosh, Camille, Camille and Charlotte Rowe and Ashley and all these amazing people came together to, to have these conversations. And the two things that really came out of, of this symposium and this conversation were, we need to focus on creating community, as everybody has talked about here today, and on developing the connections and the infrastructure so that nobody's doing it alone and everybody benefits from the work that everyone else is doing. Next slide, please. So we got to work and we started developing something. Don't worry about reading the text. I just wanted the picture here. Um, the first thing that we started developing was, was a foundation. We, we have created and we're publishing with ACRL 
an, a textbooky looking OER, an open textbook that reflects the values that we've talked about in librarianship and scholarly communication and the values that we heard about at that symposium as well. Instead of one or two or even three people writing it, uh, we've brought in a host of amazing contributors who are writing different sections. Um, and that's getting ready to be published in the next year. We have a nice slate of faculty who have committed to implement it in the next year of LIS education. So we'll start to see how that foundation dries and how it looks in different ways. Next slide, please. Having said that, and, and as excited as I am about the OER that we're creating, we recognize the, the quote that's reflected here that any textbook that you create is gonna be somewhat static and hierarchical, right? And if the core values we're talking about are dynamism and remix and shared agency and co-construction, putting out any physical static textbook doesn't really get us where we need to be, right? So, so we took that that aspiration and we said how can we do that work how can we build on the foundation of the oer that we're creating and create something that reflects the values that you see stated here next slide please and so what we've done is we've started to create this thing called the scholarly communication notebook and it's intended to be both a supplement to the book that i mentioned a moment ago and a freestanding community hub so so three things specifically that we hope that it will do and think that it will do First, we want it to be a site for open pedagogy and renewable assignments. So a student who's using the book we've assigned in a SCALCOM class or in an adjacent class that includes some of those topics can, instead of doing the old write a research paper, get a grade on it and throw it away, they can pull from the scholarly communication notebook, engage with those resources and then contribute something back as well. So, so a site for renewal in that way. The second thing the SCN I think is gonna do pretty well is it's gonna be a bridge between the communities of education and the community of practice. I bet we've all had that moment where we said, they didn't teach that in library school. And I know that OER has been an especially fertile ground for me to get to say, they didn't teach me that in library school. So I hope the opportunity to say, you know, this is how it was when I graduated in 2011, this is what it looks like in 2021. And then as five and 10 years pass, that community is gonna be refreshed through the lens of the SCN. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we're designing the SCN intentionally to fill gaps and create opportunities for underrepresented voices. Um, some of the most important work in OER is happening in community colleges right now. And most of the OER material talks about our ones like I'm at, right? So, so whatever the gaps are, whatever communities aren't represented or voices aren't there, um, the intention has been with great support from IMLS to seek out and cultivate and provide financial support and intellectual support as well for the creation of those gap filling resources. So those were our two aims. Um, fill it up with good stuff and then fill in the gaps from there. Next slide, please. So the first part of that charge, we've, we've identified and recruited a set of these uh, six community cur curators, and then Josh, Maria, and I are working on it as well, to gather the existing good stuff in the field. And we've asked these people who are each subject matter experts in, for Regina, it's OER, um, for AJ, it's publishing, for the big topics in scholarly communication, we've said, go out there and bring the good stuff to us. Bring the best open materials that are also educational materials. And we've had a lot of discussions about what makes something an educational resource and not just an open document in some sense. And they're doing incredible work in terms of gathering those resources, curating those resources and describing those resources as well. Um, so that's the first part, fill it up with really good stuff. Next slide, please. The second part is the filling in the gaps aspect. And that has been a lot of our work over the past couple of years is trying to say, if this is the state of the field today, what should it be? What opportunities do we have to, to bring together resources and to create new resources that fill gaps to reflect the existing diversity, but also amplify the inclusive aspirations of our field to do better than we're doing today and to really provide the, the in support and encouragement, but also the financial resources that it takes to create that stuff. I see a comment from Allison. We love your resource on bibliodiversity. Thank you for sharing that one, absolutely. So that's the, the quick version of the SCN as a thing. Next slide, please. 
The other thing the SCN has done is it's given us a great jumping off point to connect with and support our peers. I think any of the four people you've heard here today could point to the way the other three people on this panel have inspired, influenced, supported their work. Um, but, but through the SCN and through that Library Copyright Institute that folks mentioned a moment ago, we've been so honored to bring what we have been cooking up in our kitchens to the table for other projects and to take back from ISKME creating OER Commons, right? From Dr. Hodges making these new amazing and communities around HBCUs, et cetera, to start bringing to the table some of the work that we have done and bringing to our plate some of the work that other people have done as well. We've done that in a variety of contexts. I have two here that I chose because you see our smiling faces in the Zoom room. And on the next slide, we've also been really, really intentional about trying to create what I'm calling the intellectual and policy resources for this work. Um, so the Library Copyright Institute has been very explicitly focused on the copyright and open licensing aspects of that work. How do librarians at under-resourced institutions do OER work in a way that's informed by the best and most up-to-date information about copyright generally? And then I hope you'll join me tomorrow afternoon to talk about the Code of Best Practice and Fair Use for OER, uh, which I think has tremendous opportunity for doing a lot of the work that our other panelists talk about in terms of building more culturally responsive materials, just better materials in a lot of different ways. Um, so that's been the other sort of thing that we've jumped off into from the jumping off point of the SCN. Next slide, please. So I'm tremendously proud of the SCN as a standalone resource, but the real prize to me, and I think the real gift to the OER community from IMLS and from James in particular, are the connections that we've started to build. This is a theme that everybody has sounded in a different way, but right, the opportunity to bring this grant funded project on copyright expertise to the HBCU OER program, to create resources for the OEN that builds on the code of best practice, to pull from the great work ISKME has done to develop our hub in the first place, right? Those connections, more than any of the individual items you see there, that's the genius of what IMLS has been doing and supporting. And I'm really, really proud to be a, a small part of that work. So on the next slide, I'll very quickly give you some lessons learned and then I'm smart enough to know when to shut up after that and not get in the way of happy hour. Um, I'm gonna say things that other folks have said here. IMLS does scaffolding better than anybody else. They, they, as a funding agency, understand how to take you from crazy idea you talked about at a conference to planning grant, to project grant, to better project grant, to project grant that recognizes that COVID blew everything up and on, right? They will, they will make it possible where it would not be possible otherwise. And that's gold. That's an absolute godsend. Um, I've, I've already talked a lot about partnership and I've, I, I hope everybody's, what we've said about that has made it clear. What I do is not very exciting. What we do is tremendously exciting. Um, and then finally, something I think everybody said again, that direct communication, having somebody like James or whoever your program officer is to ask questions, to bat around ideas, to have him say in a polite way, that's pretty stupid. You should try that again as well, right? <laughs> um, that is also gold. And that is how your project becomes the thing you're proud to talk about at a conference after a certain amount of time. So that's I think my nine minutes or so, I'm going to hush up and we can get to some questions and then go from there. Thank you all so much for hanging out and I'm, I'm excited to talk some more. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Hodges. And thank you, David Ernst, for your participation today uh, in this great panel presentation about IMLS and OER funded projects. I'd like to open up the floor to questions that can be submitted via the Zoom chat functionality. Should you have a question, I will be monitoring the chat for a moment. And uh, I will also kick off a little bit of discussion while I monitor the chat. Again, I'd like to say, my name is James Neal. I'm a senior program officer with the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Should you be interested in exploring funding with IMLS, here is my name, my Twitter handle, as well as my email address. I look forward to hearing from you. I have a question for Dr. Hodges. I'd like to know how you approached the issue of communication and dissemination of your work to other HBCUs. Well, 
so far, and especially while we were planning the grant, we um, communicated with most of the HBCUs through listservs, um, the HBCU Library Alliance listserv, um, the Black Caucus of the Library uh, of ALA listserv. Um, we communicated with them. That well, that's when we were recruiting participants. Now, in terms of dissemination of information about this project, we are in the we are really in the process of doing a lot of that right now because we are developing our white paper and we have a website. Also, we have we do have a website that we um, have posted um, information from the webinars and um, we have uh, the program from our summit and you know a lot of resources we have on our uh, conference uh, projects website as well. Thank you so much. I have a question for David Ernst. David, you sit atop of a major research university and your organization is known for its national outreach. We have a variety of institutional types being represented here. Will pointed to work being done at community colleges. We also recognize there's OER work being done in K through 12 environments. One of the things IMLS is very interested in is what Dr. Hodges alluded to earlier, and that's institutional buy-in. I have been expecting um, academic administrations, deans and provosts to go into the business of creating departments of open education or departments of open pedagogy, hopefully spurred by and centered on the work of librarians at those institutions. What role or what future do you see with getting further traction and further advancement of institutional appreciation for OER work that can be driven by libraries in conjunction with academic departments? Yeah, good question, James. Um, First, I want to correct you. You said I'm at the top of this institution. I'm far from the top. So, uh, but I, I absolutely right. I think I think open education has been brought a long way on the backs of volunteer librarians who it may or may not even have open education written into their job description. It's just a passion that they've had that they and they've made huge progress. To be honest, I was in a session an hour and a half ago where the chat involved. Um, where they were talking about barriers of open education. And that was the theme. It was like, well, I've made it a priority for me. I've made it, it's something that I'm gonna spend my time on as librarians. And I think your point, your, your, your point in the shape of a question is an excellent one. And it's time for institutions to make it a priority so, it, it, so that those librarians can, will receive the support that they need. And so I think we are seeing that transition happen, to be honest. Um, we've been um, in the OEN giving workshops across states to senior leaders, um, deans, provosts, presidents, and we're starting to see some traction as they see their strategic priorities, mainly educational equity, being addressed there. And this is a strategy that they can use. And, and that's where that buy-in comes. And I think we can be successful if we if it can be approached from two directions, we have the top-down support of programs, funding, resources, staffing, and we have that passion of the librarians who are um, kind of carrying the water every day, having those hard conversations with instructors. So um, I think we have a long way to go, but I think the transition, I feel like it's starting and the conversation is starting on how to do that. Okay, uh, our moderator has informed us that we're close to running out of time but we will stay on for about three to four more minutes before ending the session. So if you'd like to pay attention to the questions I'm gonna to address to Lisa and Will, feel free to do so. Uh, will, I'm going to ask you a question regarding the issue of copyright. We all know that copyright can sometimes be a barrier or a hurdle or something that must be addressed uh, with regard to content curation and creation and you are now a part of a grant that deals with the issue of fair use. Please take the next two minutes to give further explanation of how fair use fits into copyright. That's a great question. I couldn't have asked for a softer softball. So thank you for that one. Fair, fair use is 
the, the reason when you talk about copyright, people always say copyright and fair use is because fair use is the way we do the work of actually wrestling with copyright for a variety of different reasons. Um, one of the main reasons that fair use is so powerful is it is because it really centers um, society serving practice. And so as open educators, if I wanted to put a, a quick brief to the Supreme Court about why my use was fair, if I could put the word open and education and like equity and society serving, I'm going to win that case every single time. Fair use as a body of law and as a doctrine loves and is designed explicitly to support what we do every day. So it, it is the, the softest, best end of copyright for us to engage with some of that stuff. Um, and that's especially the case because the question fair use asks is a question we're all well situated to answer. If I ask you, is your use permitted under 17 USC 1101, you might go, huh? I don't know what that is. How does that checklist work? But the, the analysis for fair use is literally, are you doing something transformative? Are you bringing your own creativity to bear to build a better place? That's what a good open educator does. That's what a good student paper does. That's what a good scholar does, is I didn't just repeat what somebody else said verbatim. I transformed it through my own intellect and creativity. So if I have to ask a faculty member whether they're in compliance with the TEACH Act, they run away screaming, and rightly so. But if I, ask to ask them if, if I have to ask them if they're doing good education, if they're doing good research and scholarship, they know how to answer that question. And they know what they can do to really highlight, this is the best piece, this is what a, the best educator would do. This is what the best researcher would do. So, so it's, it's the most welcoming part of copyright and it's the easiest to understand and implement part of copyright as well, which is why I think it has this unique opportunity for OER. Okay, thank you so much, Will. Uh, and last, I will give the space to Lisa Petridis You've been in the vineyard laboring long and hard for OER. Can you talk about some of the changes that you've seen across 